Then Isaac sent Jacob on his way, and he went to Paddan Aram, to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, who was the mother of Jacob. Okay, uh, the Aramean is a Syrian today. They're kind of in the same area, and uh, so he's going up there, and once again, we're going to see at the end of this account the treaty that's made between them. And I talked about it a week or two ago where I wonder if those treaties are still binding because it's in the Bible. You won't cross over to me. I won't cross over to you. And what have the Syrians been doing for the past week and a half, two weeks, three weeks? Crossing. Like 3,000, now 30,000 or whatever it is. They just keep they're invading the border. They're causing instigation and if this is still a binding treaty which I have no idea it's just speculation but if it is they are violating the very treaty that was made by their forefathers all those thousands of years ago but we'll get to that in a, another chapter or two. Five. Yes. That's exactly what I, I knew it was in Peter I just okay go ahead and read that. Beloved I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lust with war which wage war against the soul. There you go. Mine says sojourners and pilgrims, and that's the same terminology. And if you go to your Bible, it's probably the same terminology, you know, the translator's preference, in other words, of the words. But um, uh, you're a stranger here, and a sojourner, a pilgrim, and same thing. That is to, the way that we are to live in this world, just as the blessing was to him at this time. You're not a member of this Canaanite community, this world in which you live. All right, so uh, I think we're in six, is that right? Uh, Seven, eight, ten? No, we're in six. Six, okay. But now Esau learned that Isaac had blessed Jacob and had sent him to Bedanaram to take a wife from there, and that when he blessed him, he commanded him, do not marry a Canaanite woman, and that Jacob had obeyed his father and mother and had gone to Bedanaram. Esau then realized how displeasing the Canaanite women were to his father Isaac. Okay, do you, do you see how some people are kind of blinded to the situation? I mean, he's married him. They already have been a source of grief to him. And it would have been apparent. Mom doesn't like these girls. And yet he was just totally blind to the fact. He's just, he's out hunting game and just totally oblivious to life going on around him. And he suddenly realizes, oh, Mom wasn't very happy about this, and maybe he's starting, I don't know, I'm just speculating, maybe he's starting to process why his mom sent him in there to get the blessing. Is because he hasn't been living the life that his mom wanted him to, and, you know, it, it, maybe that's why when he eventually came back 20 years later, he didn't kill his brother, even though he had sworn to do so. As he had just thought it through and says, you know, I, whatever. But he understands at this point that what he has done was not pleasing to them. So the next verse says... So he went to Ishmael and married Mahalath, the sister of Nebaioth, the daughter of Ishmael, son of Abraham, in addition to the wives he already had. Okay. In order to get back into their good graces, he gets another wife, a, a son of Ishmael, who is not the son of promise, but a son of Abraham. And he's thinking, this will work. Okay. When, in fact, it didn't do anything. But yeah. Okay. Probably more grief, but whatever. I know if I had an extra wife, my mother would be very upset. <laughs> I would think so. So would the U.S. Well, now, nowadays they might not care. They might applaud you. I don't know. Uh, Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. So he is all the way in the very, very south of Israel. It's a long walk. I mean, it's not a big place, but it's a long walk. You're going from Beersheba, the very south of Israel, and it's, you know, it's mountainous, it's rocky, this is a real trek. I got to tell you what. I mean, adventuresome. But you got the Jordan River. You got all kinds of streams and brooks. And it's really beautiful in the middle area there. But down in Beersheba, it's all desert. And then there are other parts that are very dry and desolate. And then, of course, you get up in Syria. And I have no idea what it's like. Different times of year, I imagine it's there's grass. And other times, it's probably desert. I don't know. But um, says 400 miles. 400 miles. That was a long walk for a young, young man. Yeah, I, at least a couple days. That's right. Okay, so he's Beersheba, go ahead. Um, when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. Okay, so this is the one time in the Bible where somebody actually uses a pillow made of a rock. That's good enough. Okay, go ahead. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth. 
with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. Okay, so he is making the same promise again to him. He's confirming the promise that has already been promised. And it goes back, I think, to the even in the blessing that uh, his father gave him. He says, um, I have given him, them to you as servants and I've uh, blessed him and, you know, all these things. It's all going following the pattern all the way through the Bible, the line of the Messiah is coming through him. Uh, it, now, we have the ladder here in verse 12. Then he dreamed, and uh, a ladder was set up on earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Give me some ideas about that. Let's talk about it for a second. Where else do we see a ladder or somebody, you know, having something that reaches up to heaven? Babel. Goes Babel, okay. And that was man-made. Man is working up to God. But this one says here, it says, Then he dreamed to behold a ladder was set up on the earth and its top reached the heaven. So this is actually a heavenly ladder that is reaching to heaven. You got to go, Lil? Have a wonderful day. All right, get some rest. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Now, where does that, where is that also mentioned in the Bible? Jacob's ladder. Where is it also mentioned? Okay, it says here, uh, I'm going to go back a couple verses and we're going to say, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I saw, said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe you will see greater things than these? And he said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. The dream that he saw in the Old Testament was a dream of Jesus. He is the access that is restored to heaven. You see that? And that is what he is saying. Now, there's something about that. I want to real quickly just let you guys um, sit here quietly and fiddle, twiddle your thumbs because I want to look up something. And if I'm, I, I, I don't want to say it unless I have it properly packaged because I didn't even know we were going to get to this verse today. And um, hang on one second here. I want to, if, if this will fit, then we'll talk about it. If it won't, then you've twiddled your thumbs for absolutely no reason at all. But hang on. Any... I hate that when that happens. Charlie, that really, really, uh, uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, um, and, and Nathaniel, doggone it, it's not there, Nathaniel. Uh, does anybody have the King James Version in front of them? No. Uh, hang on one sec, is this the King James Version? Yeah, I want to see what that, what, what chapter did I just read? John 2? John 1. 51, 151, okay, and I'm going to go back here. Oh, I see what I did. Hang on one sec. I'm going to get there in one sec. All right, N-A-T-H. It may not apply, and if it doesn't apply, then you'll have really wasted a lot of time today. Let's see here. Okay, that is 3482. 3, 4. have got to go to the Greek here. See, if I had a computer, this would take two seconds instead of... Uh, 10 minutes, but 3482. 3482. Okay, there we are. Hmm. And they don't even tell what it means. Doggone it. I'll have to get it for you. Apparently, and I don't remember this, and that's why I thought that I'd give this to you. Apparently, Nathaniel, the name Nathaniel has something to do with this. Whatever it means, something of God, Nathaniel, whatever. It has something to do with this particular passage we're reading in Genesis. Um, gift of God, doesn't it? What's that? Gift of God. Gift of God, is that what Nathaniel means? We're going to name, one of our, we're gonna name Christian Nathaniel, I think it was Gift of God. Gift of God, okay, and that could be. So if that's the case, anyway, it pertains to what we're talking about in Genesis. And my 
uh, Hebrew professor in college tied it all together really beautifully. This entire passage with what Jesus said in John 1. But you see how these things are the Old Testament is concealing something. It's being revealed in the New. And I apologize for not having that for you. I'll probably cut all that out so Rory doesn't have to sit there and listen to me mumble to myself. But anyway, really, really wonderful that we see the prophecies in the Old Testament, which we don't even know that they're prophecies, coming to fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay? Um, whatever, I think, 15 was it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Okay, he's promised. He's going to be with him and, and uh, no doubt about it. And he has also said that he's going to bless him and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, okay, go ahead. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in his place. And I was not aware of it. Okay, now he is in Bethel, is that right? Yes, verse 19. This is the place, house of God, Bethel, where if you go online, you type in, to, you go to Yahoo or Google Images, and you type in name of God spelled in uh, the mountains of Israel or something like that, it'll pick, bring up Bethel. And apparently, and I'm not saying this is correct, but apparently somebody has seen the name yod Hey vav Hey or Y-H-W-H, -H, the divine name of God spelled in the mountains of Israel where Bethel is. I don't know if they doctored the photo or if it really is or not, but just so you know, this is one of those things that people, God has imprinted his name on this particular place. Whatever. Just thought I'd throw that out to you if you haven't heard that before. Um, what did you just read? 16? Um... Uh... No, yeah, 16. Okay. I did not know the Lord was in this place. Well, guess what? Acts 17, 28, in him we live and move and have our being. The Lord is in every place. Okay. He hadn't thought through the nature of God very well. Go ahead, 17. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Okay. And once again, here we have Jesus saying, as you see the angels ascending and descending on me, he is the gate of heaven. And what, how does the NIV translate it? I am the gate. All right. And I, the New King James, uh, yeah, New King James and the King James says, I am the door. But I am the gate of heaven. And this passage here is so clearly pointing to the deity of Jesus Christ, how people can come to any other conclusion if they do this study and they realize what is being symbolized here is fulfilled in him. I don't know how they can miss it. I simply don't know how they can miss it. But this is pointing to Jesus. Go ahead. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel. Okay, and why did he pour oil on top of it? What does that symbolize? Mm -hmm. Anointing. It symbolizes the Holy Spirit. What is it? 1 John 2, 20 maybe? Anybody? Let's see here. 1 John... 1 John 4, 1 John 2, 1 John 2. But you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. The anointing would come at the time of the ordination of a king, of a prophet, of a priest, like Aaron the priest. They would take oil and anoint their head. It's a symbol of the Holy Spirit being uh, conferred upon them. All right? That God's authority rests on them. And he's saying, this is the house of God. And they've anointed it. They would also, I believe, anoint. And I, don't, I, I may be totally wrong on this. I know that they would, um, the tabernacle would be um, purged with blood, you know, to sanctify it. But maybe they put oil there too. I can't remember. But oil was used in the ordination process of things and people in the Old Testament. That's what's being done here. All right, go ahead. 19. He called that place Bethel. The city used to be called Luz. Okay, and what does Bethel mean? House of, God. house of God. Beth is a house. It's also the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Bet. Okay, and then El, God. So the house of God. Go ahead. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking, will give me food to eat and clothes to wear, so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. Then. Yes, then the Lord will be my God. Yeah, but you know what? The funny thing is God is speaking to him. He has the vision and he says, then, you know. It, it's, it's as if they don't really understand the, the concept of God being the only God. You know, I, I'm sure that they did, but it's just the way it's termed, 
it seems like they don't understand there could be other gods, you know, which was a common they see, belief. They see other gods being worshipped, they just aren't real. Right, that's right. And so I don't know, I don't know their understanding of monotheism. 